Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wu Qi. I am a machine learning engineer at Ontolox. Um, for the past few years, I have been working on uh, natural language processing, large language model fine tuning, and um, model compression. And today, I am here with my colleague, uh, Betam Sandik, who is the machine learning technique uh, in our uh, research department. And we are very happy today uh, to be here to present you the talk machine learning with domain-specific ontology for your IT security industry. And while this uh, is quite a lengthy uh, but informative title, I would like to point out that there are three main points uh, from this title. So first of all, we are building a machine learning system um, and, uh, for automatic text analysis. And second of all, we are building this machine learning system with the help of a domain-specific uh, ontology. And thirdly, this uh, specific domain, in our case, is the IT security industry. So that's a breakdown of this lengthy and informative uh, title. However, we do have a more clickbait title for our audience here today, which is Ontology ML Never Label Again, <laughs> which is not entirely true, because for building any machine learning system, um, either it's for the training or at least for the evaluation of the model, some amount of human labeling are still required and unavoidable. However, this title does um, express our ambition and the motivation of this project and this talk today. Uh, we are using Ontology ML to try to uh, reduce the amount of human effort for labeling the data to the minimum. So. Um, before I start the talk today, I would like to present you our company, Neophony Group. Uh, we were founded in 1998, and uh, with the development and the launch of, uh, by the time it was um, the most used German search engine, Fireball, and throughout the last 25 years, we have been exploring in different uh, domains, and we now also provide services in uh, content management, e-commerce, uh, mobile and operation. And in 2021, with the rise and success of artificial intelligence, uh, in, uh, especially in, in the natural language processing field, we founded Ontolox, where we uh, focus on text mining and intelligence search. And at Ontolox, we not only um, provide consultant uh, services for our clients. We also develop our own uh, tools and then have our own research. So as mentioned above, uh, Ontolox is an AI agency. Um, TextVec is our product um, and our tool that we develop in our team to help our client to um, uh, do text and automatic text analysis. It is a lightweight framework which can be uh, easily combined into your workflow and uh, to gain some insight for the unstructured um, text data. And um, yeah, so what kind of text insights can one could possibly gain from the unstructured text data? Here is an example. It is um, a project that we have been working on uh, with the Federal Office of um, um, the information security in Germany, and in short, is um, BSE in German. Um, so the BSE has a lot of tasks. They do a lot of things around the topic of IT security. And one of the tasks uh, was to generate a yearly report, which would give us more of insight on what has been happening in the realm of IT security. And to do that, you need to analyze a huge amount of text data. And uh, the BS, uh, BSE wants to do that and while uh, also automate the process and optimize this process. So we help them um, to do a text, um, develop a text analysis tool. And uh, as we can see here, here is like um, a screenshot from the report from BSMI from 2022 that we could say, for example, there has been more than 200 days of uh, days of digital emergency, or there have been 15 millions of report of um, malware infection. Yeah, a dangerous time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's the use case in our in, in this project. Uh, now we are getting more, uh, a bit more into the detail of what kind of text analysis we are doing. 
Um, so um, the first one is uh, name identity recognition, NER, which is quite a common task in the natural language um, process. Um, so the, um, the um, goal here is to detect what kind of named entities there exist um, in a text and what kind of classes they belong to. We have some common classes such as organization, dates, uh, person, but uh, yeah, in different domain and different use cases, there could be different things that one might want to detect. In IT security, for example, we want to know what kind of hacker group there might be, there what kind of vulnerabilities in a certain system that might uh, suffer from. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, the first named entity recognition. And the second one is enter named entity linking. Because in some cases, we don't, do not only want to know what uh, kind of classes um, a certain entity belongs to. We also want to know what exactly is meant here. Uh, here, as an example, New York is uh, classified as a geopolitical entity. But um, with named entity linking, we can also know that ah, this is a New York City that's meant here. And um, this is uh, it's, uh, it's like a unique uh, entity in Wikidata so that we know, OK, it's a New York City, not the government of the New York or like some pub bank that's also named New York. Um, yeah. With the help of uh, name and recognition and uh, linking, we can do a lot of um, analysis, uh, such as automatic train detection. We can see throughout the year what kind of hacker group was more active in which region of the world uh, and gain some more insight of, um, of a certain uh, field. And the second thing that we might um, could do is hierarchical search. This is quite familiar to all of us when we go online for any online shopping, we might want to look for a keyboard and then you could define, okay, do you want to look for a keyboard in the instrument department or like more like a computer component? So here's the advantage of the, the automatic text analysis is that we can uh, generate metadata from uh, raw text so that it allows us to do such things as a hierarchical search. So we can say here, for example, I want to look for all the articles um, about some certain uh, malwares, and you can do that. Um, and yeah, as a summary of what we would do as the automatic text analysis is first, we gathered a lot of text uh, data from different sources, um, or in the realm of IT security, and, uh, and then we do our automatic text analysis with our tool, and then with the help of this, we can do a lot of uh, insights analysis um, building upon that. Um, yeah. So, and how do we do that? So, as the name of our company Ontolox might suggest, we do this uh, in an ontological approach. And um, and what is the ontology? So, for those people who might not be familiar with this term, you can see it as um, um, a kind of knowledge graph. So, it is there is like some kind of entities and um, some uh, categories that those entities belong to, and the relations, uh, relations between different kind of categories or um, the concept. And in the case of uh, IT security, this is what um, uh, IT security ontology might look like. You could have here an organization uh, under organization that could be like a sub category of a hacker group, and under hacker group, you could have all different sort of uh, individual hacker group that appeared in the past. So you could have a more hierarchical and get like a more structure, um, a clear structure of this a specific domain. So uh, ontology has a lot of ad ad advantages. Um, First, it's very adaptive to different domains. Like now we are building an ontology for IT security. You could also use this for many different things. And secondly, it's comprehensible. So to us human, it helps us to understand a certain domain. 
Uh, and there has been an active community on the open um, knowledge, uh, knowledge graph, such as Wikidata. So usually when you want to build a domain-specific ontology, you don't have to start from the beginning. You could usually take a subgraph from the Wikidata and start from there. Um, yeah, so, and we are doing, doing this, we are building the ontology for IT security for our, uh, for our customer with our tool TextVec. Uh, even though TextVec is not limited with the functionality of entity link linking and recognition, we also have a lot of other functionalities such as, um, yeah, text classification and uh, sentiment analysis and so, and so on. Uh, yeah, so. There are a lot of problems that one might encounter when it comes to name entity recognition and uh, linking. So the most challenging one is that human languages are ambiguous. So who can tell me what the word cell means? Like without context? <laughs> Probably not because there, there's a lot of meaning and they are very diverse. They could mean like a solar cell that generates energy and it could be like a cell where prisoners sit in, so they are very diverse. And uh, the problem is that human languages are very ambiguous and there are like hundreds of thousands of terms that have very ambiguous uh, meanings. And um, more related to the, um, to the example that we are addressing here in our project in the IT security is the example of DOS. So I think when people here in this room hear the word DOS, um, for the f when you just hear it, you, the concepts that pop into your mind might probably be uh, the disoperating system. Yeah, but uh, in the domain of IT security, it usually means that uh, something else, denial of service attack. And uh, not only that, DOS could also be like a random village in Romania or like a studio album by Green Day. So for us human, it is rather simple to determine what kind of DOS is meant here, depending on the context. But it's, it is more difficult to teach a system uh, so that it can determine what exactly is meant here. And um, yeah, so my colleague here would present to you uh, how exactly we do this with um, an ontological approach. And as a meantime, of course, we also um, are um, uh, experimenting a different machine learning technique to improve our system. And so I will hand it to my uh, colleague. Yeah. Thank you, Chi. All right, so a problem that we've spent quite a lot of time. I think it's very interesting. I think it's uh, nice to think about the fact that during a talk like this, every one of you will have like hundreds or thousands of these examples of words that have ambiguous meanings, and you are completely capable of solving these ambigu to, uh, ambiguities um, subconsciously without even thinking about it. But it is very hard for um, a computational system to do anything like that. Um, we want to present you one way you could approach this problem if, for example, you want to implement some kind of uh, ontological named entity uh, linking. This is the way we do it in TextVac, um, the ontological way we do it. Um, so you can think about the, the term um, disk operating system, and in an ontology, we will know different concepts that are related because they are connected in uh, the knowledge graph. So we might uh, know something like operating system, Windows, Unix, Microsoft, Assembler, or something like Microship. All of, all of these are somehow connected to disk operating system. And what you can now imagine is um, we take this data, and uh, this is the technical approach that we have, but um, we built a vector where every dimension of this vector is one of the related entities, and the magnitude of the vector is the strength of the relation in the ontological graph. Um, there's many ways to get this exact mag magnitude. Um, let's not think about it too hard at the moment. Um, what we also need is the other side, which is uh, what we call the, doc document, <laughs> the document context vector. Um, which is, uh, imagine you have a document and our system finds a lot of other concepts in 
uh, this um, document. A lot of them we might have an a priori relatively high estimation that we are certain about which one this is. So these are not too ambiguous themselves. Uh, and we create what we call the document vector. And here again, um, every dimension is the entity, the concept uh, in the ontology, and the magnitude is again um, the strength of this, uh, um, of this concept connection in the ontological graph, and it's also multiplied by how often it appears in the document. These are technical things that you don't have to worry about too much, but what we do is um, we compare these vectors. So we have in the middle here, basically, the document vector with all the concepts that appear in the document. And then we have the relation vector for um, disk operating system, and we have the relation vector for denial of service. And we compare them, for example, by doing like a cosine distance between them. Um, and what we get is basically a disambiguation score. The higher the similarity between these vectors, the more likely it seems that this is the concept the text is actually talking about. Um, all right. So, or may, maybe I let you sit with that for just a second and drink it. So, we were promising machine learning at some point. We talked a lot about ontologies. Um, I want to talk about the pros and cons about these two approaches to problems like that. Because um, all the text analysis that we were talking about, you can do them with um, machine learning uh, approaches as well. And actually, at Ontolux, we do that. Um, but they have different pros and cons. For example, the development co cost. Um, for ontological systems, you need an ontology, um, which is hard to create. For machine learning, you usually need training examples. You need labeled training data. Um, generating an ontology is actually quite labor intensive as well. But we are giving a couple more points here, because usually you don't have to start at zero. Um, you have these communities, you have Wikidata, uh, you usually start with a large knowledge graph about the world, and you can use a subgraph of that that is tailored to your domain. Um, machine learning, uh, you need all these training examples. Our customers usually don't have them ready. Um, and also another point is the ontology you can actually use for other things as well, while, while the training data is usually just useful for your machine learning training task. Um, then you have ad adaptability. Uh, ontologies are quite easy to adapt. You can put new concepts into them, you change relationships, it's quite plug and play. Um, for machine learning, this is not the case. If you want to introduce a new concept or a new class, you kind of have to go through all your old training data and update it um, conceptually. You have explainability. This is also great on, in ontologies. You can read them. They are, when you get used to them, quite understandable for humans. Um, this is uh, a weak point of machine learning. Everybody knows that there is quite a few approaches to solve explainability in machine learning, um, but we, also, we, we often call these models black boxes, and we actually do not exactly know how they achieve what they achieve. Um, you have the comp computational cost. The example we gave you, how to do ontological named entity linking, for example, is quite fast. Um, you need a couple of vector multiplications and some lookups. You might lead, need quite a bit of memory to store your onto ontology, um, but except for that, computation is fast uh, and inexpensive. Machine learning is again known for being a bit more costly in this case. You might need a couple of GPUs, uh, it doesn't scale very well. Deployment is hard. Uh, people try to solve this problem for some time now. Well, now I'm. Uh, well, everybody is talking about machine learning and not so much about ontological systems. So I'm obviously keeping something from you. So these are the last two points. There is quality. Um, ontological systems are good, but all the state-of-the-art papers you will find about named entity linking and recognition will. Um, have some kind of machine learning uh, solution at the moment. They are just better for certain tasks. Um, 
And then there is, and this is a huge point for us, generalizability, um, where ontology systems just fail. Everything that is not in your ontology will not be found in any of the documents you have. Um, and here, machine learning models shine. If you train a machine learning model correctly, it learns some semantical relationships in the data. And it has been shown that they can uh, classify um, documents that have not been in the training data. You might find a hacker group that has never been mentioned before, but if the context of this entity is hacker group-like, your machine learning model might find it. So these are different pros and cons, and we want to bring them together. We want to have the advantages of both worlds, basically. Um, so the way we are trying to implement this is we are starting with an ontological text analysis framework, like TextVac. We generate an, uh, an ontology, and then we can cheaply and fastly uh, take a lot of documents and um, annotate them with metadata. And we can use this as synthetic training data to train a large uh, language model. Um, and this has the nice additional effect that uh, when we created a strong machine learning model, we can actually use the outputs of that model to inform changes to our and, uh, and additions to our ontology. All right. So every one of you has, who has worked with machine learning models before might look at this and think, ah, I'm not sure if this works. Um, because there is a problem with machine learning models, um, when you have not too much training data, or you have training data that shows patterns, which it would because it shows you the patterns of the ontology you are using, machine learning tends to learn shortcuts. Machine learning tends to learn when you're fine-tuning a large language model that has a lot of semantic knowledge. During fine-tuning, you tend to overfit on the training data. Uh, and this might happen here. You might learn the ontology, you might memorize everything that's in the ontology, and forget everything else about semantic learning. This is a problem that you might encounter. And we have um, found some solutions around this. I wanted to visualize this for you. This is not a text model, but it kind of, these models are similar. Um, this is from a Google AI block, where they show uh, uh, an image classification model, and they try to visualize with these are prototypical images. They try to visualize what the system has actually learned. What you're seeing here is the prototype image for a dumbbell. In German, it's Hantel, or a, a weight for weightlifting. So something like this. Um, and you might look at these images and think, what has it learned? It has learned this generic structure of like gray, I don't know, shapes connected. But it also learned this here, right? What is this? I would argue this is an arm. So it learned that weights are usually connected to an arm, which is not really the thing we wanted to uh, detect, right? This should not be an arm detector. Um, it learns this because often in the training data, these things are appearing together. Um, these are the examples. So this is uh, um, predicted to be a sliding door. There's handles on here, but it says sliding door on the door, which is kind of funny. Um, this is detected as a pineapple, which is a burger with a lo lot of cheese. Uh, and you're seeing that here it obviously is using some heuristic that uses color and shape to say this is uh, a pineapple. And these problems are hard. I like this one, it's chihuahua versus muffin. You can try to, if you're just looking at it sideways, it is very hard to tell which one is a chihuahua and which one is a muffin. This one I'm not, uh, whatever. Um, thank you. Uh, so we try to find ways so that our machine learning system learns the thing we care about, the semantic structure that we want to learn, and not some superficial relationships that just, that just um, I don't know, care for some color and shape. Um, all right. And how could we do this? So one, um, one thing we tend to do is we try to regularize the model, um, which basically means you have this huge pre-trained model where you used, for, for examples like GPT-4, you use all the textual data that you have available, the whole internet, you have some 
hugely expensive training process and try to learn everything you can about this data, and you hopefully learn a, learn a lot of semantic structure. Um, you want to guard this structure from pre-training, right? During, uh, uh, from fine-tuning. You want to fine-tune this model, but you don't want to forget, you don't want to overfit. And one way to do this is you can freeze a lot of the parameters in the system. And you learn some, and these are some very new ways to do this, you learn some additional parameters. So your uh, model might get a bit bigger, or actually you do some fancy thing with uh, matrix man uh, multiplication, and um, you learn some extra adapters that are just glued on top of the um, model. These are some ways. Uh, P-tuning uh, V2 or LoRa or very new Q-LoRa are examples of this approach, uh, which is often um, referred to as parameter-efficient fine-tuning. All right. Another way we could do it um, is augmentation. We might find some new data that forces the model to not learn superficial relationships, but um, keep the semantic structure. And what we did here was we asked ChatGPT, basically, you can use a large language model. And what we basically want to do is um, we have this sentence, the hacker group something something attack German servers or something. This is in our training data. Because we don't want it to learn the word here, we might ask ChatGPT, hey, ChatGPT, here's a word. Here's the name of a, a hacker group. Um, come up with some fictional other names of hacker groups. And this is what uh, ChatGPT gave me. It gave me Elysian Collective and Cypher Crew, Quantum Vortex, which all sounds very cool, and I would argue quite like hacker groups would sound like. Um, so we can use near infinite amounts of additional, um, well, not additional training data, but at least tokens here, um, to force the model not just to memorize the word. But now, if we do this too much, it might instead memorize the context sentence. And we also do not want that. But we can, for example, use um, large language models again. Here I used a bit of a different example. I gave the model one sentence with a denial of service attack. Uh, and I told it, give me some other context sentences that might also appear around a den denial of service attack. And it generated these for me. Companies need to be prepared for the potential risks proposed, posed by denial of service attacks. The increasing frequency of denial of service attacks has raised concerns among businesses. And now we could also um, combine these approaches and switch these words out for other generated words. So um, this is data augmentation, or often also um, uh, um, um, re referred to as uh, knowledge distillation, because we are trying to transfer some knowledge from the large pre-trained language model, so GPT-4, for example, transfer it into our, um, into our named entity recognition system. All right, this was, this was it for us. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I know it's getting late in the day. Uh, I, I think we have a bit of time for additional questions, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Chi. Thank you, Bertram. Do we have any questions in the audience? Sorry. <laughs> uh, hello. Thank you for the for the talk, it was very interesting. Um, so you, you showed a slide with the uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, both models. So it was like uh, the ontology, ontological and machine learning, yes. And then, um, like, what would be the, let's say, the the score of the combined methods? Are we somewhere in the middle, everywhere, or what? What's well, what should we? Take as a conclusion. I, I think this is hard to answer. I mean, this is already kind of arguable. Everything I'm doing here, right? I'm doing like a four, five-star uh, rating concept. Um, but uh, I think what I would argue is it's not easy to tell which of them are preferable. It really depends on your use case, and they have these strengths and weaknesses. Um, while ontologies are fast. 
uh, and, and easy to understand. Um, machine learning has the large advantages in quality and um, generalizability. So if your customers have the compute and do want to um, invest the development time, I would always argue for a combined system or one that at least um, incorporates some machine learning. Uh, I, I can't give you, I'm sorry, I can't give you like a, like a definite scoring. But thank you. Question. Um, I would like to know about phishing emails or emails where some hacker groups uh, spied at a company for several months to adapt to the patterns which is used in the email. Do we have any examples for how you perform or some false positive rates? So, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, it's a problem that our um, customers are facing. Um, it is hard, as you do in, uh, as, as you maybe know, in in, um, in projects like that, to have a good uh, evaluation for these things. Right? You usually need to generate some data, usually by human labeling. We have a data set, but it is very domain specific. Um, so I can just give you like a qualitative overview of what we have experienced. Um, it is quite hard. The task of generalizing is, is hard, uh, uh, especially in um, uh, when, when you find something that is structurally very new to, to maybe the types of attack that you have encountered in the past. Our, um, uh, we, we have seen cases where we, we, we um, can solve this problem. So we, we know that our machine learning model that is trained with this uh, solution, it finds... Um, it finds entities that have not been in the training data, but it is a bit hit and miss. So some of them that are structurally quite different from the training data, it uh, might not detect. And also, um, it, uh, it's usually a bit of a trade-off. Um, because we are training a bit smaller models, something like an XLM Roberta model, uh, whenever we try to optimize for generalizability, we lose a bit of performance in the already known um, entities. But that is where we would, um, that we would give you the advice to use like a combination method of, like, uh, of, of the uh, old established methods to do this and machine learning. Um, I would like to give you a better answer. It's a good question. Um, uh, it's hard to, to show you data here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the evaluation of like a machine learning system is anyway quite difficult. And uh, but we also say with the development of a very very powerful uh, large language model, it also gives us the opportunity to e generate even better synthetic data. And with the parameter efficient training that we've mentioned before. It also gives us the opportunity to even fine tune a very, very large language model and for it to generate better uh, synthetic data for your use case. And then you use those synthetic data to even also train a little bit smaller uh, machine learning model. However, the problem is still maintains, like uh, you would always have a problem of like how well the system actually works. But at least we know like we are improving. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was curious what kind of level of precision your clients uh, expect from your system. Are they more, we need 100% and you need to provide us with some user interfaces to actually interact with the system to correct errors or what's the kind of the expectation level? Yeah, thank you. Also, a very good question. Also, always a hard topic to um, uh, to, to show in a, in a talk because I would have to. We we are gathering evaluation data, but this is also it. You you want to have a very large comprehensive set um, to to be able to actually have a have a look at this. Like, what is your precision? Um, we can show that. So so our our values that we usually get is uh, for for the classes that are already known classes for named entity recognition. This is something uh, classically like uh, location, organization, um, uh, person, and miscellaneous. Uh, we can um, keep the uh, 
the F1 score, the scoring that we see in papers there in the, in the literature, while also adding other classes, so around 90% there. But for um, other classes that we have added for IT security, um, which is something like uh, uh, threat groups or hacker groups, uh, vulnerabilities or um, malware, we get more something around like 70%, uh, even on our own evaluation sets. And there, it is very important to do qualitative analysis. You have to look at them and you see that uh, things that look a lot like, as, so that look structurally like our training data, we are quite good at, um, uh, at, um, um, at uh, uh, detecting. But with other things that are, and this is another problem, we often find disagreement even during uh, human raters. So you have a bit of disagreement why we are creating the evaluation data set. And sometimes we're just saying, well, the, argu the, the algorithm is kind of right about that, or you might be of two minds about it. So it is very, I, I feel like I'm weaseling around your question a bit, but it is a very hard uh, problem to answer. We are quite fond of the solution, and our um, customer is quite uh, happy about it as well, because uh, even if they find some um, false positives in there, uh, they, they still get directed at some trends and then for, at the moment they have to see and analyze everything themselves and now they have an algorithm that directs them into uh, a direction. Uh, but thank you, it's a good question. Uh. All right, I don't see any questions online. Oh, there's one more. Um, I, I had a question about how the ontology works with, uh, with ML. Uh, is it an evolution of your product that you started with an ontology and now you are fully uh, ML-led for uh, entity uh, detection? Or do you still use both? You start with, still with a human-generated ontology and uh, you keep evolving this ontology uh, through the uh, ML-learned relationships? And do you still need this formal ontology now? Oh. I see that you have this, this loop process. Is yes. Is still something uh, which is... Um, yeah, uh, we are still using the ontology appro approach because mm -hmm. we not only want to detect like, uh, what's, what's, what's in the text, we also want to build the knowledge of like, the domain of the IT security. Mm -hmm. As the loop shows, we are um, enforcing the machine learning algorithm to help us because the ontological approach, you can only detect the hacker group, like the entity that's already mm -hmm. in the ontology. And yes. then we want to update this ontology. Mm -hmm. So we are still doing like an ontological approach and detecting the entities that we already know. And then we use this um, generated data to train a machine learning model. And this machine learning model would detect then like entities that was not known to the ontology. And then we update the ontology. And mm -hmm. it's like a circle that we yeah. kind of improve both at the same time. OK. Then when you, you have this side-by-side -side comparison, in fact, your machine learning could, could not have existed without a good ontology uh, at the beginning. Is, is that correct? In, in our case, that is correct, yes. I mean, there is other ways to bootstrap uh, machine learning. In, the, in most projects we encounter, you usually you, you ask them if they have uh, training data, they say no. Um, you ask them if they have any documents, they say, I don't know if I can give them to you, then at some point they give them to you, and, uh, and, and you do, I don't know, some mechanical Turk labeling, or you have a team of experts doing this, and then you can bootstrap like this, and you can do it just on the machine learning side. And what we are kind of arguing for is that this approach actually doesn't cost, cost much more time. You get an ontology basically for free, you also will have a machine learning uh, model and the start of it feels a bit nicer. It still work, uh, it still work, but it has a lot of advantages as we see them in our yeah, project. You have the great plus of explainability of, uh, of the ontology. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you all very much, uh, it's getting late. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.